Um, often when I'm speaking to young pastors or maybe pastors in training, it's hard to convey how quickly Sunday comes Amen. every week. <laughs> Dennis knows. Um, I always say Sunday comes every three days, whether you like it or not. It happens so quickly. And, and life in, in this in-between space happens so fast. Yet you come sometimes to moments like this where the music is phenomenal and you, oh, oh, and, and you think, wow, we should, we should do more like that. And, and oftentimes what they're thinking is, man, the music was phenomenal. We're going to have to do this again next week. <laughs> it's hard uh, because a lot of life is lived in the in-between. In fact, a lot of life, almost all of our lives are lived in these ordinary, nondescript non-platform kind of places. In my house, I always say there is no glory if there is no gory. The idea being you don't plug in to those places and those spaces where on a platform and there's, uh, there's notoriety, I guess, and there's lights and there's microphones. You don't get to just step into that spot if you're not willing to walk through all the other spots in between. The glory is actually what makes the glory matter. So much of our life is lived in this in-between spa space of ordinary time, ordinary places. And I don't know about you, but I don't like things that disrupt my ordinary life. I don't like changes that I don't understand. I, I, I don't mind changing, um, but I don't like not knowing. And so much of ordinary space is not knowing. I told you, Dana and I spent, um, spent the night, uh, Friday, Saturday, in Kansas City. We got there in beautiful weather. We left in horrible weather. And we were staying in a hotel near downtown, on streets that I was not familiar with, an area of town that I really haven't ever driven before. I used to work for Dish Network when we lived in Kansas City, and I thought I had been to every part of that city doing installs. I was wrong. I found myself for 24 hours driving white-knuckled, hoping to God that I was not turning the wrong way on a one-way street because they're all one-way streets. And, 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 and the, the way the town is laid out down there, it's not laid out in grids and patterns that you can predict. It's laid out like a game of pickup sticks. And you're not quite sure what you're turning on to or where you're going. And it is stressful. Moments like that are stressful when we're out of the ordinary, out of the rhythm of our own lives. Um, I felt it even this morning. The going joke for the last 15 years of ministry is that whatever I'm preaching, that's the week I'm going to have. And I'm talking about how ordinary places are oftentimes disrupted, and I come this morning and immediately lose my sermon notes. Um, lost my tablet entirely. Thankfully, Dina found it for me and handed it to me. I had printed off a copy as kind of a scramble, but I don't like it when, th when my ordinary life is disrupted. And I'm finding more and more, maybe it's the older I get, that I'm repeating sentiments that my parents and some of you have said that used to drive me nuts. Well, I don't understand why they had to change that. It was just fine when I had to go outside of the house to use the restroom. Why did we have to bring plumbing indoors, right? I, I find myself echoing that sentiment. At least that was how I used to think you sounded. And then I, here I am, and I'm finding that I don't like unpredictability, unpredictability in the midst of my familiar places. Um, I, 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 this wasn't just Kansas City. This is my life. If you, want, if you want me to engage in homicide, plan a surprise party. I don't like them. I'm not just saying that as a way of hinting that I would like a surprise party. 
Now, I, I genuinely don't like them, and I, I, I think it would cause me to, to murder someone, especially the person that plans it. Um, notice, Dana and I have been married 22 years. She knows not to plan a surprise party. Um, it, it's a special kind of person that enjoys unpredictability. And by special, I mean annoying. <laughs> because I'm not one of them. I practice everything. I practice everything. I practice board meetings in my head. This is not good. This is not good. Um, so I'll make an agenda and we'll have points. And I, we have a great board now. We've always had good boards here. I, in fact, in 15 years of ministry, I don't think I've had a bad board. Uh, but, but I write out these agendas and then I will drive or walk or go somewhere and I will work through that agenda in my head. And I'm going to say, well, when, in my head, I will, I'll say, well, when I raise this point, Dave Lawson is going to disagree with me. <laughs> he, do, he doesn't. I'm just picking on him. Um, but I, I, I'm going to say, oh, you know, Dave Lawson or, or Susan Smith, she's cantankerous. Um, and uh, <laughs> she just shakes her head. Um, and, 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 you know, she's going she's gonna to say this, and then I'm going to say this in response to Susan. And then someone else is going to say that, and then I'll say this, and by the end of this drive, I'll have had a full, angry conversation, and I'll come to board meeting ready to fight. And then I'll get there, and they'll be kind and gracious and patient and all of these things, and I'll walk out, and Dana will say, so how was that? And every time I'm surprised, I'm like, it was good. <laughs> How did that happen? I practice everything. Um, and, and, and so I have found the familiar space for me is a comfortable place. But also I've equally found that the familiar places of my life are also the place where I lose myself most easily. The routines and the rituals, the, the things uh, that are familiar that I stop even seeing and hear me uh, and hear from them. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for spontaneity so long as we plan it accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> what, are we, what, what, what are the plans for the day? Well, I don't know. Okay, when is everyone getting out of their pajamas? Oh, eventually. No, no. It is 930. No PJs. Right? We need a plan for the day. Um, and, and it can be spontaneous, but we need to know that it's going to be spontaneous. <laughs> right? This is the way I live my life. Um, a familiar ground, this comfortable place, this familiar ground, this terrain that we know how to navigate, even if the lights are off and our eyes are closed, this is comfortable for us. I like that kind of space. This is where so much of our lives are lived. Um, there's a kind of ordinariness to life that brings rhythms and routines that are essential to navigating life. We need these rhythms. We need these routines. We need something of predictability. It is ordinary and it's familiar and it moves us through our day. Can you imagine what it would be like if we didn't have these routines and the ordinariness of life? We would have to think every step of the way. And I've seen how some of our thinking works. <laughs> Sometimes it's best not to have to think, to just move through life. Um, and, and so we like this idea that we're, we know what's coming. We're going to get up. We're going to get the kids ready for school. We're going to run a load of dishes so that we have plates to eat off of later that same day. Of course, even that load of dishes means that there's still uh, another load of dirty dishes in the sink that needs to be run after that. But, but this is how, this is the predictableness of our life. We need clothes, so we're going to run a load of laundry. We need dishes. We're going to, we're going to run the dishwasher. We need to get to school. We're going to do what it takes to get out the door. There's nothing miraculous about this. There's nothing profound about this. This is the majority of our life. It's the majority of our day. Uh, I'm, I'm going to maybe come to the office. I'm going to read some emails. I'm going to read another chapter in another book that I'm not going to remember by the end of the day. I'm going to throw in another load of laundry, and by then my 3 o'clock alarm is going off, and it's time to set up for crossing duty. Right? Just 
And it sounds like I'm complaining, but the reality is, is I like that. I like that. I like my, knowing my alarm's going to go off at 3 every afternoon. I like knowing my kids are going to leave the house at 7.45 every day. I like that. It's a good thing. Um, I, I'm going to take my pills. I'm going to try to drink more water than coffee. I'm going to fail miserably at that last one. I'm going to pretend um, throughout the day that life is under control, even though I am always one tragedy away from everything coming apart at the seams ordinary and then we get the phone call and all of a sudden our ordinary is interrupted we get that diagnosis we get that bounced check we get that late notice in the mail all of a sudden ordinary is disrupted can I say oftentimes we have given the impression that the life of faith is one of constant, extraordinary events, one after the other. We read through the book of Acts, and we go, why can't we be like this? Why isn't the church like this? Failing to recognize that the book of Acts spans decades. These, weren't, these were singular moments with a lot of ordinary in between. Ordinary time is the rhythm of life. And while I both love and hate the ordinariness of life, we've got to recognize that there is, that, that the life of faith is not lived in the moments of the extraordinary. It's lived precisely in the rut and the routine of the ordinary. And so I, this is why I want to talk about this, because Jesus is coming to familiar ground. Cana of Galilee, he was a Galilean. He spoke like a hillbilly. That, that's what Galilee was in terms of Israel as a nation. Do you remember at Jesus' um, arrest and and quasi-trials, pseudo-trials that he endured. Um, Peter, one of his disciples, was around the fire pit and three different times someone said, weren't you one of his followers? And he kept denying it. He even, he even used some profanity at some point, calling down curses upon himself. But one of the people there says, I think you were with him because I can recognize it by the way that you talk. Right? You know, you know, it's Galilean accents were very much in the Israeli world what a southern accent is in a Yankee world. <laughs> it's like, really, do you know how you sound? That's the way Galileans, that's the way Jesus talked. And so he comes into this region and it's ordinary. It's what he knows. And he's going to an ordinary event. Now, I know weddings were a big deal. I've heard the sermons. I've read some of the books. You know, they were week-long events back in the day, uh, 2,000 years ago. Some of you remember that. And, and still nothing. Still nothing. Oh, well, I, I'm not going to stop. So you might as well just get over it and laugh. Um, but, uh, um, but, but he comes to this. We look at this as an extraordinary moment this week-long celebration and it's extraordinary to our senses because we don't do it like that because marriages come and go um, but it was a week-long thing and uh, it was a big deal and we look at that and we go well it was an extraordinary event yes but it was such an ordinary part of life it was part of the rhythm and so here Jesus is on home turf stomping around in familiar areas um, his mother is even there it says later even his brothers were there so there's something of a family reunion and he comes to a wedding why not let's go to a wedding I think it's an important point why was Jesus invited to a wedding because he was fun to hang out with I think I mean, we forgot that right why 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 aren't Christians invited to parties because they're party poopers and every party has a pooper that's why we invited the church party pooper remember that song I just rewrote it um, but uh, um, but but this is the idea Jesus was fun to hang out with he was good company he was invited to a wedding probably someone he knew his mother and brothers were there he he doesn't quite have 12 disciples at this point um, but the disciples he does have go with them and everything is going as it should it's ordinary and it's no small matter to recognize that this is where we first find Jesus performing a miracle is in the ordinary places 
We so often look for Jesus on top of the water. We so often look for Jesus breaking bread and multiplying a Lunchable so that every, a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children could eat. We so often look for Jesus in these extraordinary moments, but Jesus' first miracle happens in the midst of ordinary common ground, and, and not just common ground, uh, but familiar place, familiar places for him, uh, familiar places for the people around him. And it's no small matter to recognize this. Cana of Galilee was the region where Jesus lived and ministered. Do you realize in Jesus' whole three-year ministry, he never, he never went further than 50 or 60 miles from his hometown? Draw a circle around Nazareth, and Jesus never went further than a hundred miles within that circle from end to end. This was Jesus' whole life. I love the idea that, that, that God moved in Jesus at three miles an hour. Right? That's the walking speed, the average walking speed. Um, and, and God moved at three miles an hour. Ordinary, slow sometimes, intentional. We're always so quick to move beyond the ordinary that sometimes I fear we're losing the miraculous in the midst of the ordinary. So this is where we encounter Jesus in our passage for, day, for, for the day. Um, uh, that, uh, that encountering him, sometimes the way we've told the story so often misses the ordinariness of the story because we're preachers. And we've got to make big points with big gestures and make it, make it big because big, big sells the story. It's a little harder to sell when it's just part of life. It's a little harder uh, to convey how essential this is, the familiarity of life and how critical it is that faithfulness would be found in the midst of the ordinary. Um, and, and truth be told, it's the hardest part for us to be faithful is in the ordinary. It's easy to be faithful in the extraordinary moments. It's easy to make big decisions. It's easy uh, to do those things that seem grand and over the top. That is easy. What's hard is all of the ordinary in between. And this is where Jesus steps into the scene. And it frustrates me. It frustrates me that we have so ignored the ordinariness of this. Do you know even our doctrinal statements tend to ignore the ordinariness of Jesus' life? I am a creedal Christian. You're like, I don't even know what that means. Um, the, the church has, has, has gathered itself for millennia, for two millennia, about 1,800 years around central creeds that define who we are. Um, the earliest articulation of this is something we call the Apostles' Creed. Uh, some of you are from traditions that uh, read or recite that every week. You can find it in our hymnals. Some of you don't even know what a hymnal is, of course, we are inclusive, so if you prefer hernal, that's fine as well. Um, but uh, <laughs> nothing, still nothing. I, whatever. Um, you, th you think I'm going to learn my lesson. I will not. Um, but, uh, but we have it in our, we have these creeds in our hymnals. Uh, I think it's page eight for the Apostles' Creed and a couple pages later for the Nicene Creed. Um, the Apostles' Creed is, is the earliest articulation of it. The Nicene Creed came in about 325 to 381 AD. And it's kind of a, a, a deeper theological, uh, theologically parsed way of articulating some of the same things. But we've missed it even in our creeds. I'm not the first to recognize this, but you always walk on tenuous ground when you disagree with something that is as ancient and central to the narrative of the church as our creed is. But I want you to hear this. Here's how the Apostles' Creed reads. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, and he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, 
and was buried and he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and he ascended to heaven and is, is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And then there's, uh, there's more about the spirit and about the church. But did you hear the problem in there? Here, let, me, let me say it to you again. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. We just celebrated this, Christmas, right? And then he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Do you see what's missing? 33 years. We went from the birth to the crucifixion. In our creedal statement. We even miss the ministry. Of course the resurrection is part of this. And, and this is the point of the creed. That he was, de he was dead. He was buried. He was raised. He's ascended. All of that's there. But 33 years is missing of Jesus' life. And so we tend to think that Jesus lived the entirety of his life on the cross. That the point of everything was the cross. And that is, it's the literal crux, the literal cross of, of all of, uh, of the human story. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that the cross is not some kind of, of appendix to 30 years of a life. It's not some kind of add-on. Neither is, is the 33 years of Jesus' ministry prior to the cross some kind of prequel to what actually happened on the cross. It's all bound together. One leads to the other. Without the ordinary life of Christ, the 33 years of life, there would have been no cross. And we've got to remember that because so often we become frustrated and overwhelmed in our own faith because we're wondering where the extraordinary is. Now, well, maybe we're looking for the extraordinary in the wrong places. I suspect the extraordinary is found specifically in the middle of the ordinary, of these common places, of this familiar terrain for us. Maybe, maybe this life is too ordinary for us. It's tough to think about a Jesus who was reprimanded by his mother for getting too close to a fire as a toddler. Well, wait, J Jeff, Jesus never sinned. I didn't say that. He still had to learn stuff. Uh, he still had to grow. In fact, there's a, a passage that I've never quite been able to get over. In the book of Luke, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. How does Jesus grow in sta stature with God and in favor with God? I get the, the humanity portion, but there's such an ordinariness to this that Christ himself, Jesus, had to grow and learn and understand and explore and wonder and maybe even experience doubt. I've often wondered in Jesus' mind if he ever, as a 25-year-old man working in his father's shop, if he ever, as the Spirit was speaking, if he ever went, I can't think these thoughts. The Son of God? That's heresy. I know better. I ever wonder if he doubted himself in that regard. Uh, uh, Hebrews tells us that even Christ had to learn obedience through suffering. It's ordinary. How does Christ, the God-man, learn anything? I thought he came pre-downloaded, right? I thought he was like the first century version of, a, of, a, of an, a Mac or a, an Apple computer where you don't have to add an office suite, you just get it all. I thought that was the way Jesus existed, but Scripture seems to say no. There was something about the ordinary in Jesus. And so here we are. We find him in this ordinary, this, this, this common ground, this, this thing, this place that is familiar to us, familiar ground, we might even say. And, and, and it's here that the first miracle is performed. It's here in the ordinariness that miracles are birthed. The miraculous is born out of the mundane. 
Oh, I wish I could get that. The routine. The miraculous is born out of the mundane and the routine and the daily grind of life. Missing this point means that we will miss out on so much of what God's intent is for us. When we are constantly waiting to walk on water, we will never understand that these moments only come in the midst of the ordinary. The disciples were just crossing the sea to get to the other side. They're like the first century version of the chicken crossing the road. Why was Jesus walking on the water? Not because he, early in the morning, he said, you know, today's a good day for a stroll on the water. No, the disciples were just crossing the sea. A storm just came up and Jesus just had to catch up to where they were. So ordinary, yet we're waiting to walk on water without ever recognizing that we've got to row the boat to the middle of the sea first. <laughs> ordinary, so, so ordinary the ordinary is the birthing room for God's presence in our life I love what Walt Whitman once said in his introduction to leaves of grass he says life is born in the eating and sleeping rooms of the house in the ordinary this is where life is born. So, so in the midst of this ordinary, we should probably mention the ordinary expectations of a wedding. Uh, we've talked some about them. It was a week-long celebration that involved uh, um, a, a catered event for all that were in attendance. And usually, everyone was in attendance. Small towns, small regions, small, um, small, um, small clans, relatively speaking. But food and wine were an important, uh, important component of, this, of what was considered a social norm, uh, a, a normal expectation. Um, to run out of wine at an event like this would be tantamount to running out of coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense, even though... Starbucks doesn't sell coffee. <laughs> uh, this is a gripe, has nothing to do with the sermon, but it's in my notes in case you're wondering. It, it's it's, it's a for free, but um, don't go to, to Starbucks and order coffee because they will tell you, you don't want a coffee, you want an Americano. No, I just want coffee, just give me coffee. And uh, okay, what size? Medium. You mean, and then they give me some Latin word. I don't even know what the word is, venti? No, I just want a medium coffee. Like, no, I'm just going to Quick Trip. Shut up. <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't run out of wine at a wedding, and you don't run out of coffee at Starbucks. It's not just, well, they shouldn't have, have, have expected so much. No, that's the expectation. This is how it works. And it's an ordinary expectation, even though for us it seems extraordinary. Like, Jeff, the next wedding we do, I am not paying for an open bar. I know how that will go down, even with Nazarenes. Nazarenes who don't drink will say, but it's free. <laughs> right? So can you picture the scene? Can you picture the scene? Um, Jesus is sitting, mingling and laughing. He's congratulating the newly married and introducing his new friends, the few disciples he's gathered to other attendees. Then very quietly, his mother comes up beside him because mothers pay attention to things. And he says, hey, she says, hey, there's no wine. That was it. That's all she said to him. And his response was, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> Woman, why are you putting this on my plate? Woman was not derogatory. Don't worry. Um, but but it, it, was very, it was very loving. Why, but why me? Jesus is like, my time has not yet come. Now's not the time. Well, well, Jesus, what are you waiting for? Is the implied question Mary's asking. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting to walk on the water? What are you waiting for? This is where the miraculous is birthed. It's right here, right now. And she never even addresses Jesus again. She never answers him. Isn't that amazing? How like a mother. Um, I, I, I spoke to my mother this morning, and, uh, and I asked her a question, and she says, well, that is the dumbest question I've ever heard. Because that's what mothers do. They just say what, what needs said. And, and, and I won't tell you the question because you'll probably agree with her. Um, and then, and then, you'll, then you'll judge me as well as, as much as she did. Uh, but, but, but this is the thing. He says, what does this have to do with me? She doesn't respond, well, yes, it is your time. It's time you put your big boy robe on. 
He didn't wear pants. Um, it's time. <laughs> come, come on. You're getting there. Uh, you'll warm, we'll warm up eventually. Um, but it's time you put your big boy robe on, right? It's time. Uh, now is the time. Don't tell me when the time is. I'm your mama. I've known from the beginning when your time is. Um, and, and so she doesn't even address Jesus again. She just looks at the people that are serving and she says, just do whatever he tells you to do. The assumption is, Jesus, you're going to do some stuff right now, not tomorrow, right now. And Jesus does. Ordinary. How ordinary. Isn't, isn't it kind of an ordinary conversation? Replay conversations you've had with your mom, your dad, your spouse. Such an ordinary conversation. We can see ourselves in this situation. Of course, we don't have the miracle ability that Jesus did, but I can hear a similar story or a similar kind of conversation occurring with my parents. It's just so ordinary. Um, regardless of that, Jesus actually did do something, and he gave directions. I picture Jesus doing this with, a sigh. Well, mom said. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Mom said. Mom said. And, uh, and so maybe with a sigh, maybe not. I don't know. I have troubles picturing the Jesus that always has the halo and has the glow and, and, and the choirs. Oh, every time Jesus shows up. I have troubles with that Jesus. So I picture Jesus with kind of an exasperated sigh going, giving directions to those around. And he says, okay, guys, do you see those stone jars over there? They've been used for purification rites. When you get ready to go into the temple, there's six of them, and uh, they're huge. They're like 30 gallons each. They're massive. And uh, Jesus is like, um, Jesus is like, fill them up. And, and they're like, it's 180 gallons. And Jesus says, I'm a first century Jew. What's a gallon? And uh, um, and, and he says, he says, fill them up, fill them up. And uh, so they, they start going to the well and they start one bucket at a time. That's how you fill them up. You draw it out of the well, 180 gallons, one bucket at a time. Eh, ordinary, maybe even a little tedious. It didn't solve the problem immediately. That's what we want miracles to do is to solve the problem right now. But this took time. And so they filled them up, fill them up with water, how much, all the way up, uh, and then they come back, um, I imagine him saying, oh, done already? That was fast, you guys are good. Okay, now draw some water out and take it to the master of ceremony, the MC, right, and, and let him sample it. Can you imagine what they were thinking, let him sample the water? Hmm. Wow, that's good water. It has tones of animal feces in there. Yum, right? Well water. It's not the best kind of water. It, it, there's better water, but, well, it's just water. Um, <laughs> nothing. Wow, wow, a hard crowd today. Um, uh, so so he, says, he, he says to him, take it to the MC and have him uh, take a sip. I, kn I, know, I know it's just water, but you're just going to have to trust me. So you know the story. You know the story. You know how this ends. Somewhere between the water well that filled the vessels and the cup of the MC, the master of ceremony, that water became wine. Yeah, here's what's interesting. Read carefully. That water did not become wine in the vessels. It did not become wine there. It was water. It was not wine until it was drawn out and served. You see... We want the miracle of 200 gallons of wine so we can step back and go, look at what we've got. And Jesus says, no, you got nothing until you give it away. Right? It doesn't become wine until it's served. This is the part of the miracle of what's going on. It's not the fact that they have 200 gallons of wine. It's the fact that somewhere between that vessel and that well and the lips of that master of ceremony, something changed. When? Where? Who knows? Uh, no one seemed to know. Um, all they knew was that when the wine was sampled, it was good wine. It was the best wine. It was aged wine. 
all of the things that need done for good wine was done to this wine, but it was done somewhere in the walk between the well and the master of ceremony. What a, what a miraculous thing in the midst of an ordinary moment. And I want to apply some of this to our lives. You see, this is the miracle of our, our lives, that ordinary places, that is, familiar ground is transformed and made new when it is shared. Not before, not after, but the ordinary becomes something new altogether when it is shared, when it's given, when it's poured out. If we are merely concerned with being filled up, then we will never know the way in which God takes what is ordinary and makes it something new altogether. Yeah. Uh, we, we like the idea of fill, being filled up, don't we? Ritual purification vessels. That's what was filled up. Uh, we like our rituals. We like our routines. For some of you, you're here this morning because it's just what you do on a Sunday morning. There's nothing wrong with that. You didn't come with grand expectations. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, you didn't come with any preconceived ideas. You just came because it's, it's just Sunday morning. And I don't know what I'd do if I didn't come because it's just what we do. There's a routine. There's a rhythm to it. That's good. That's right. But if you came just to get filled up and you come week after week just to be filled up, guess what? You're never going to get filled up. All you're going to do is retain water. <laughs> Anybody here retain water? Let me see your ankles. Yeah, yeah. I, you know how this works. I, I have congestive heart failure. Doesn't that sound horrendous? The emphasis should not be on failure. The emphasis should be on congestive. It's not as dire as it sounds. You don't say, um, when you get a cold, you don't say, I have congestive nose failure. Right, you know, like, no, you'd, you'd hear that and you go, what, you have what? No, no, it, it's, I've, I've got congestion and, and, and it's water and it tends to accumulate around my heart and sometimes in my lungs and it makes it hard to breathe and my heart makes these funny noises and, and, and all of this stuff. So I start retaining water. My ankles don't swell, but my lungs fill up and I start coughing and carrying on and, 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 and it's just, it's very nondescript, it's very ordinary, and, and here's the thing I do with that is I take a water pill, right? When it gets bad, I take a water pill because I'm just retaining water, and I worry that sometimes the church needs to be given something of a water pill <laughs> because we come expecting to always be filled and our vessels always to be filled, and all we're doing is retaining water. We're retaining well water, nothing more than well water. And Jesus says, right in the midst of this ordinary, I want to do something extraordinary. And so here's where it begins. Points of application. It begins with ordinary obedience. Just do what he says. Doesn't that sound so simple? And some of you are like, I've asked God. God, I will do whatever you tell me to do. You've just got to tell me to do it. And I think there is a sense that in the ordinariness of obeying Christ that we've got to recognize he also gave us brains and brain cells and he expects us not to waste them, Amen. right? God, if you just tell me what to wear in the morning, I'll never wear plaid pants again. <laughs> My plaid pants last week did not go over well. I, it wasn't the pants, to be fair. Um, it was the brown shoes with the black jacket. No, that did not go over well. I haven't heard the end of it. Um, but now the, the, the gauntlet has been dropped to layer uh, plaid on plaid, and I am looking for the appropriate outfit. Um, but God didn't tell me what to wear that morning. You're like, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I, I know, you don't have to convince me. I know God didn't tell you, and obviously you didn't look in the mirror. Um, but, uh, but we want God to give us an answer for everything, and sometimes God is like, no, life is ordinary. Sometimes you're going to have to dress yourself. Sometimes you're going to have to feed yourself. Sometimes you're going to have to get a job for yourself, and you're going to have to go to work, and you're going to have to make decisions about cars and insurance. And Well, God, if you tell me what the right insurance plan is, there's not a right insurance plan plan it's all wicked so you might as well just die and get over it 
right? And God's not going to tell you. But God, if you just tell me, I would do what you say. Or this is not what I mean by ordinary obedience. What I mean by ordinary obedience is faithfulness in all of those small things of life. The getting out of bed in the morning. The way you navigate through life. The way you're going to spend or invest those 8,000 plus seconds that you have been gifted for the day. How will you spend them? That is what ordinary obedience is about. Do what he says, yes, but do it in a way that he would do it as well. Ordinary obedience. Can I tell you, ordinary obedience is much harder than extraordinary obedience. If you want the life that is lived in the profound joy of the Spirit, it's going to be in those small moments. I've been very frustrated with something that I see in all of these silly books I read. Some of the spiritual fathers and mothers, the mystics and the ones that, that seem to have uh, the closest relationship with God, uh, the, the experiences that they encounter uh, frustrate me because they always seem to come on the heels of a life that has, in a sense, rejected the world, lived absent from it, maybe cloistered away in a monastery or in the desert like an ascetic or, or, or up on the mountain alone like some kind of guru or in a sense of constant deprivation, always fasting, always suffering, always, uh, always, uh, always giving more, never, never is it enough, always, uh, always, uh, always trying to offload the world, the burden of the world from my life. And that has frustrated me because why must the experience of God only be experienced by those who live in the deprivation of life? I think there is an abundance that we can experience God in the midst of a wedding, in the midst of a shortage of wine, in the midst of these moments, that part of this first miracle is God saying, you don't have to be completely um, devoid of joy or even happiness. You can't, he's not saying you can't enjoy wonderful things. He's saying, actually, my, the experience of life comes in these moments, but you can be faithful in these moments. Can I tell on myself for a moment? I sat in a dark auditorium on Friday night watching the show Wicked, the backstory for The Wizard of Oz. And it turns out it was more than a backstory. It was a morality tale. I was not prepared for that. And it grabbed me. That tale grabbed me, and it profoundly affected me. And there's this scene right before the intermission. It is, it is this, uh, this uh, stage production's version of Elsa's Let It Go. <laughs> you remember that one? Uh, the Ice Queen, and she's finally given herself over to whatever, and she sings this great big song, Let It Go, Let It Go, and we're all like, shut up already. And, uh, and, and she's, everything's turning to ice. Well, this kind of moment happens in this program. And I sat there, the room was dark, and I heard her singing, and I had this weird visceral reaction. I started crying. So glad the lights were down. I'm so glad my mask was up. And I, I, I felt foolish. Like, why are you crying, dummy? And uh, especially since I was sitting behind the big head with the broad shoulders that you can't see around. You know that guy. And, uh, and I thought, man, if he turns around, if I sob and he turns around, he's going to demand my man card. And, and I'm going to remind him, hey, buddy, you're at a musical too, so shut right? But, uh, but I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there, and I, I start crying, and like, why, why, why is this affecting me so much? You know what it was? She was, the, the vocalist did this amazing job, and then the, they, she was on this contraption, and she went up in the, in the air, and there was this big 
sheet or something, just yards and yards of fabric that they had this fan blowing on. You couldn't see all of this. I was watching the production of this, and this, this rippled, and she's, in a sense, she's levitating in the middle of the, screen, uh, the, middle of the stage. You don't see all the apparatus, and this, this billowing fabric is moving, and she's, and it looks like it's coming out of her body, and the lights are there, and she's singing these uh, amazing notes, and the harmonies are spot on, and her vocals are amazing and I sat there and wept because it was beautiful and I thought there is something in this ordinary extraordinary moment that is just plain beautiful and I think God delights in the beauty like that and I think this is what ordinary obedience looks like that there is we can enjoy the profound uh, profound joy of God making beautiful things and making all things beautiful Ordinary obedience. Here's the second thing. Ordinary service. Ordinary service. It wasn't wine until it was poured into someone else's cup. We spend a lot of time trying to fill up our vessels, and God spends a lot of time trying to remind us to fill up someone else's cup. Mm. Ordinary miracles happen in the midst of ordinary service. And I think this is a good reminder for us that the miracle does not occur until it is given to others. We grow so frustrated in our lives because we do not see God's hand in the ordinary places. Yet it is hugely important to realize that the ordinary stays ordinary as long as we keep it to ourselves. The frustration of your ordinary life oftentimes is met in the fact that you've not shared it. Well, it's just ordinary. Perfect, perfect, just like mine, just like countless others. It's just ordinary. Um, you can't keep it for yourself. There comes a point in our lives when we are filled like these stone vessels to the brim. Nothing more to fill. We are filled with all that we need to accomplish. And what we can accomplish is much more than we could ever Imagine we are filled. Yet it, when we are filled, we seem so empty sometimes because we're not pouring out and we seem so empty so what we start doing is we start adding more stone containers to our lives uh, more of a supply a reservoir of water and our lives become nothing more than broken cisterns where things that fall into our lives just rot and taint all of it hmm. there is an ordinariness to service for us and you're like well give me uh, give me some good examples Oh, boy, preparing dinner for your family. Meeting someone who's bereaving. So ordinary. Um, uh, going, uh, we have so many faithful people here. It's hard for me to give an example because you guys live this out better than I've seen most churches. The way you've served for funeral dinners makes me cry. I'm so amazed the way that you love one another is profound. And, and you're not waiting for extraordinary events. You're there every day. Your alarms go off at 3 o'clock or 7.30 in the morning for crossing duty. Or, or you're coming and you're teaching uh, the Bible study. Or you're moving kids around. Or you're setting out donuts. Or you're putting out offering boxes at the back. Or uh, this is just in the church. Or you go outside the church and you're the ones at your neighbor's house just talking over the fence. I learned more about being a Christian from the man who lived on the other side of the fence from me in Kansas City. He was my Wilson Wilson. You remember from Home Improvement? He was my Wilson Wilson. And he was not a Christian. Yet I learned more about being a Christian from him than I have from a lot of people in the church. It was ordinary, just over the fence. There are countless ordinary ways where God is waiting to perform countless ordinary miracles in our lives. How will you pour your life out? Um, here's the last thing. We've talked about ordinary obedience, ordinary service, but this last one is the culmination of all of it. It's ordinary miracles. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? The, the whole point of miracles is that they're extraordinary. They're not ordinary. Ordinary, but God gives us this sense of ordinary miracles, miracles as an ordinary part of our existence. 
I have been so enraptured of late of the ordinary miracles that I have missed my whole life. The other night, again, beauty. Beauty gets me. Didn't get me like I got it. But beautiful things cut through all of the noise in my life in a way that I can't explain. And the other night, I remember I was sitting there. It was late. The news was done. I was frustrated with the news. And I went outside, and the sky was clear, and the lights were off, and I stood in the middle of my yard with my neck craned up. And I felt like, I felt like you know, I, I should just be spinning around with my arms wide open, singing a song. It was so overwhelming. That ordinary miracle was that, that I've seen, I've seen every day of my life. Is, is revealed to me again. And this is what God does with our life. These things that we stop seeing become ways in which God is seen in new and magnificent ways. Our lives become this. Um, you see, this ordinary sense of the miraculous is the best way to fill your vessel. The best way to feel filled is to experience the ordinary miraculous which comes in ordinary service. You want to know what you got? give it away. You'll see. You'll see. And, and what you've not got, you'll get. Because what you've given and what you've already got, you've given away. This is how it works. This is the way God's kingdom is. Um, we quickly grow disheartened sometimes because no matter how many vessels we add to our lives, the content of them is nothing more than water. But notice even in this passage, it is of huge importance to know that there are six vessels in the story. Six vessels. Did you get that? John is, the gospel of John is, is, is focused in on certain numbers. Seven is an important number to John. It's a huge deal. Um, there are seven I am statements in the book of John. These I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door to the sheep pen. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the true vine. Seven times Jesus uses these I am statements. Seven is important to the gospel of John. Guess how many miracles are recorded in the gospel of John? Seven this is the first of seven, water to wine, healing a Gentile officer's son, healing a paralytic in Bethesda, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing a blind man, finally raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, and notice the cross itself even culminates on days six and seven. He's crucified on day six. It's interesting. On day six, he says, as he breathes his last, Tetelus die, it is finished, which is exactly, if we were to look at the Old Testament in its Greek translation, is exactly the word that is used on the sixth day when God looked at everything that he had made and declared it very good. He said, it is finished. Here's Jesus now on the cross on day six of creation. But now he's hanging on the cross and he says that same thing. It is complete. The, the old vessels, the old ritual vessels are filled. It is finished. And notice what happens on the seventh day. It's when all of the fruit of the previous six days comes to rest. Hmm. Seven days, enjoy it. God says to his creation, enjoy it. Uh -oh, cr with Christ on the cross, it was in the tomb because there was an eighth day coming. But seven is a big number for the book of John. Why in this first miracle would John only talk about six vessels? There is a seventh vessel. Guess what that seventh vessel is? It's you. It's me. Um, you see, the old vessels are completely filled. The old way of doing things are completely filled. Now it's time, that which is filled, to pour itself out. You see, this is where the miraculous occurs. And, and there's a, a minor reading to this story, and it's going to come as a surprise to you, but I prefer the minority opinion on this reading. Um, you, you all look so shocked. Um, but here's how this minority reading of this passage goes. You see the ancient Jews have a very specific word for 
drawing water out of a vessel or drawing water out of a well. You understand, water is the center of the community. They didn't have running water. They didn't have spigots and faucets. They didn't have any of that stuff. So if there was no water, there was no life. So they would build their communities around wells. And their language, like Eskimos that talk about snow, their language reflects the importance of water. So they have a very specific word that means to pour out of a vessel or even to dip water out of a vessel. And they have another very specific word that means to draw water out of a well. If you say this word, the best way we could translate it is draw water out of a well as a phrase. But for them, it's one word and it means one thing, draw water out of the well. Here's what's interesting in this passage is Jesus first says, Fill these vessels with water. And he says, draw water out. And in there, he uses that word, draw water from the well and fill these vessels. And then a little bit later, he says, now draw water out and take it to the master of ceremony. Guess which word he uses? He uses the word that means draw water from the well. Here's the minor reading and the one that I prefer because I think the language encourages this. Jesus wasn't saying draw water from the vessels that have been filled. They're filled. We don't need to do anything more there. Go back to the well because there's an unlimited supply there. Do you realize if this is right, there wasn't 200 gallons of wine there. There was an unlimited supply. Keep drawing, keep going back. And the more you go back, the more there will be. And it will never come to an end. This is what the Greek language actually implies. And I think it's an important lesson for us, this idea of a well. Because wells, if you look at them, do not fill up to the brim like these vessels did. Remember Jesus said, fill them up to the brim. If you go up to an edge of a well, you're not going to look in and instantly see a water level just right at the edge of it. That water level is down deep wherever the water table is that's where the water level is and if you never draw water out of the well guess what happens it silts in the water goes away oh it's gone somewhere else it's still there it's just an unused well dries up um, and so the way you keep water fresh in the well is you, it doesn't bubble up and you don't it, it's not like that where it's pouring out the way you keep water fresh in the well is you keep drawing from it again and again, and again, and again. You see, this is what we see in here. Those six days, those six vessels, the, uh, the just short of being fully perfect, that ritual was not perfect. Those ritual purifications couldn't do that. Just short of that, th that number six, six vessels, Jesus says there is a seventh, and it's an unending vessel in me so that you can become the springs of living water yourself. Seven is the number of completion. Um, and so this is what this story tells us, is that there is a completion in the midst of the ordinary that tells us that we, we can drink from abundance of what God offers. We know the frustration of being thirsty but never satisfied. We know the discontent when we look at our lives and wonder, what am I missing? So we keep adding vessels. We keep adding water faucets. We keep digging wells, needing God to fill up. When God is waiting all this time to draw us out and to draw out of us what we have received and to fill the cup of another. So here's the lesson for the day. It's very ordinary. If you're thirsty, drink. If your vessel is full, fill another cup. Isn't that simple? How ordinary this is and how this moves us in our life. I pray today the service is a breath or a drink of fresh water. But for our lives, we need more than a service. We need more than a song. We need a Savior whose well never runs dry, whose supply is unlimited. And this is what he promises us for this day.